evidence for the viability of progress toward a nuclear weapons free world is empirically realistic. And when you will see today in this presentation that there are international institutions that have been created which have the factual foundation to, to, to lay out the argument that we can move toward a nuclear weapons free world. I'm a lawyer and I've tried many cases in courts. The most powerful cases are those that are based on facts. You present the facts, you present the empirical evidence, you present the law, and then a decision is made. If the law is on your side and the facts are on your side, the likelihood of prevailing is very high. In this instance, the law is on the side of those who want to move toward a nuclear weapons free world. The International Court of Justice has unanimously ruled that there is a duty to negotiate to completion a legal framework or instrument eliminating nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty contains within it a provision that compels movement in that direction. The facts are that nuclear weapons can be eliminated. And so today we will be hopefully giving you some of the material, empirical material, that will help you as advocates make the case more effectively. I'm honored at this juncture to introduce Ambassador Tibor Toth, who is the Executive Secretary for uh, the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, the CTBTO, is the international organization tasked with promoting and monitoring compliance with the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which bans all nuclear explosions. Ambassador Toth has been actively involved in international disarmament and non-proliferation issues for over three decades. From 1990 to 1993 and from 2003 to 2005, he was the ambassador and permanent representative of Hungary to the United Nations in Geneva. From 1997 to 2001, he served in the same capacity to the United Nations in Vienna. In these capacities, he represented Hungary at the Conference on Disarmament, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and its Board of Governors, as well as the CTBTO. He was also ambassador and permanent representative to the preparatory commission of the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons in The Hague. His experience in international affairs in the field of arms control, non-proliferation, and disarmament is, uh, is unique because he, is, he, is, uh, he has worked across the board with biological weapons, chemical weapons, and nuclear weapons. And his experience in helping to create this very powerful, effective international organization is, uh, is laudable in the highest degree. And for that reason, it is a great honor to present to you Ambassador Tibor Toth. Ambassador? Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon. I hope you are not too hungry. Uh, I will try to provide some intellectual food. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned hard facts. I think there is a contradiction. I'm a diplomat. Don't expect from the diplomat hard facts. But I will try to speak uh, about the reality. Uh, the reality of uh, policies and practices which are unfolding in front of me, potentially in front of you as well, as a result of putting nuclear weapons policies and practices in the context of the Tesben, Tesben Treaty, Nuclear Tesben Treaty Organization a Preparatory Commission. So I would like to use uh, the, the title, Policies and Practices, and try to show to you what kind of standards um, are emerging in my perception. I am emphasizing in my perception because I do not speak for the organization and I hope by the end of this talk I can feel that I at least spoke for myself. The relevance of um, observing uh, policies and practices against the tax benefit and the organization for me it's clear the um, test is playing an important part in this uh, continuum of nuclear weapons uh, design, development, testing, um, uh, uh, production and weaponization. 
uh, from a different angle, again, the uh, no test uh, norm and the no test institutions are an important, uh, what I call, uh, cornerstone uh, elements for nuclear disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation, nuclear weapon free zone and other areas as well. Again, from a different angle, the 3S, uh, safety, security and safeguards, and very easily one can add a force as silence of nuclear weapons. Nowadays and during this uh, PREPCO meeting of the NPT review conference, uh, reporting cards are uh, quite commonplace. Uh, we have seen a number of them. Uh, I had a very quick look at them and I would like to emphasize that I do not want to go in this direction while trying to assess uh, practices and policies. I'm very happy what is emerging from some of these reporting cards. Uh, I quickly checked the reaching critical wheel, GCSP, uh, Swiss reporting card and uh, CTBTO is given out of the five action plan four green lights between us, I would be even more happy if Action 10, instead of a red card, received a, a green card or green traffic light. To have no misunderstanding, Action 10 is the entry into force of the treaty, not the participation in the 2013 uh, Article 14 Promotion of Universality Conference. The relevance uh, of uh, uh, these uh, traffic lights and reporting cards are important for assessing progress in the context of the action plan. But again, I would like to see how much existing practice policy might be relevant for the future, might be relevant not just for one area, has been not just for one organization, my, my own community, but for other organizations as well. So for the future, for other relevant organizations, how it might be uh, something referred to. I do not want to put these standards into neat boxes. So I do not call them best practices or even good practices. I do not want to call them not so good uh, practices or not so bad practices. So I, I leave for you uh, practically for me these are reference points, mutatis mutandis applicable. Some of them are treaty based, some of them are emerging practice. What is common probably is they are all embedded in a global arrangement. And you will hear from me again and again uh, that how important it is to approach issues in an all-inclusive manner from the point of view of a global regime. I would like to use a play of words, global words. So if you wish, the organization I'm working for has one with 83 members, so it's global works, but with a play of word, I'd like to make the point that global works. Okay, so on the policies and practices against the, uh, the uh, test ban, in the mirror of the test ban, uh, especially on the uh, nuclear weapon uh, and nuclear weapon state dimension. Uh, what I would like to emphasize uh, is that. Uh, the policy, uh, first of all, for the test ban is that no one should be practicing. And uh, I would like to show you a, a chart. Many of you saw it from me many, many times. So this is the policy of not practicing. The chart is quite clearly demonstrating that uh, during the last decade or more, the uh, four to 500 nuclear weapon tests per decade 
the moved 99.5% uh, back in the bottle. The gene was the gene of nucleobacterium was moved back in the bottle. Uh, the bottle is to be sealed through the entry into force. Some might make points what is a red flag in the Monterey Institute card. Uh, some might make the point about uh, subcritical testing. But the, but the main message here is that yes, we managed to apply policies and practices in one important aspect of regulating the risk and the uh, menaces of nuclear weapons by pushing it uh, back to zero or near zero. We did it in a way where um, we do not have the haves or have nots. The prohibition obligations for the valid 83 members of the CTBT are the same. And I think it's important when we are speaking about all inclusiveness. It's important to have uh, one category of uh, member states. And it's equally important to see an equal absence of haves or have nots on the verification obligation side. The significance of the absence of this differentiation is that the no test can be pursued effectively, in my judgment, only through this all-inclusive global arrangement. And again, uh, this chart is uh, speaking for itself that uh, without this differentiation on the prohibition obligations, or without a differentiation on the verification obligation, it works. It will have to be again further consolidated by the entry into force. Uh, why it is important, especially on the verification obligations, to, uh, to visualize uh, the standards emerging uh, from the no test arrangement? The Number of the uh, international monitoring system facilities is around 380. You don't have to know exactly the number, uh, but it's around 380. The nuclear weapon states are to host around one third of those facilities. It's uh, nearly 130. It's slightly higher than, than 33%. And from that point of view, I find, again, as a, as a new emerging standard, where uh, nuclear weapon states are contributing without differentiation of have or have nots, without the differentiation uh, uh, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, quality of the, of the verification obligations. So these are not vol voluntary verification obligations. These are verification obligations which are not just relevant to certain facilities which, which are chosen uh, by the nuclear weapon states. These verification obligations of hosting stations are stemming from the treaty itself. And to a certain degree, it's no surprise that the nuclear weapon states are carrying the heavy burden of one third of the verification obligations. Uh, at the same time, compared to other standards, I think this is a standard which we shouldn't miss from side, and we should, for the future, have a look whether, again, that is mutandis, this could be an emerging standard for the future as well. Um, it's interesting to, to see uh, not just the verification obligations, but the implementation as well. So, in terms of in terms of scoring, uh, again, in this uh, new wave of benchmarking and, and scoring performance, one could ask the question: Okay, what is written in the treaty is one thing, but what's happening? And 
I do not want to be a messenger of too many good news because the messenger might be short. I know that it might be uh, that uh, if, if I deliver too many good news, it, it might not be uh, the, the best way to survive in, in, in some of the meetings. But let me try to make the point that the uh, nuclear weapon states are making good progress on not just uh, undertaking uh, the verification obligations, equal or, or higher than other countries, but in terms of implementation, by now, uh, United States, France, UK, Russian Federation, the, the range of putting in place the monitoring stations is 80-90% or, or above. For the United Kingdom, it's, it's about 90%. Uh, hopefully China uh, will be uh, converting its uh, installed facilities into what we call certified facilities as well. So it's, it's important that there is an element of leaving up to, to those um, uh, obligations which will have to be buying into force in place. If you conceptualize that element, I would very much put this uh, notion in the box of transparency uh, and verification where the nuclear weapon states are ready and willing to play their role as well. It's, uh, of course, it can be translated through the number of facilities they are hosting and the number of facilities they put in, in place. The in the context of the uh, operational testing, uh, the, the data and the data products they are ready to share with each other and with other nations as well. The interaction between uh, the MPT and nuclear weapon states in the, in the context of the treaty might be an interesting notion to again to visualize what is the significance of it. We take it for granted they are sitting there in the meetings and that they are um, uh, participating proactively in the different fora. Uh, but let me try to make the following point about that. Um, there are uh, very few fora right now where the nuclear weapon states in a continuous mode of operation are there. It is extremely important if you would like to see progress on nuclear disarmament where in addition to uh, the uh, uh, United States and the Russian Federation other nuclear weapon states uh, get engaged and they play their role as well. It's a good feeling hopefully to the other nuclear weapon states that this, um, this uh, participation together with the, with the other nuclear weapon states from the, from the MPT uh, this is uh, bringing up uh, constructive and positive elements. It is definitely a forum where uh, even on certain issues uh, there is a continued closer cooperation. One element which I would like to mention is the on-site inspection element, where the on-site inspection issue is uh, keeping together some of the P5 uh, countries in uh, more direct discussions. At the same time, and I would like to emphasize that as well, there is a readiness of the P5 and the nuclear weapon states under the FPT to, to interact on critical issues like the on-site inspection and uh, the methodology and all the relevant elements for the on-site inspection with the rest of the international community. The, again, the, uh, the ex experience of the uh, P5, MPT P5, uh, will, uh, will gather is, uh, on one hand, an important determination, hopefully, for the future, how far this experiment might lead, us, lead them to foresee a similar engagement further down on the road. In addition to that, uh, of course, no one can deny 
that hopefully they see this involvement in a, in a global setting as an efficiency element as well. Uh, there are many, many things uh, nuclear weapon states can do on their own, but with this cooperative arrangement where uh, the nuclear weapon states on, on equal footing are working uh, with other members of the arrangement, it's leading to important efficiency gains. They have a higher return for the, for the money they, they invest as well. Of course, uh, the highest return is for those around 170, 175 countries which in the absence of the CDBT and the CDBTO would have no information whatsoever in the area of the, of the no-test implementation. But again, uh, for the nuclear weapon states, it's, a, it's an investment efficiency issue as well. I don't want to go much beyond this element, I am just uh, flagging it, but I would like to move as well to a category. Uh, this is the category of uh, non mpt states uh, with nuclear weapons. I'm trying to be very careful with the phraseology. What you understand, uh, which are the countries um, I'm uh, speaking about. Um, unfortunately, uh, quite a number of them are missing. Uh, from more uh, constituency. Uh, the missing signature uh, of uh, DPRK India and Pakistan is, is an indication who uh, should be there. Uh, let me use the example of Israel. Israel signed uh, the, the treaty. Israel uh, has not ratified the treaty. Uh, and uh, we are encouraging, together with other seven outstanding ratif uh, ratifiers, Israel to ratify the treaty. Let me try to make a step and try to conceptualize what is the, what is the significance of, of um, Israel uh, being as a signatory, uh, at least in, in this arrangement. Um, the, both uh, as, a, as a state which is not an NPT state with uh, nuclear weapons, it's important for, for these countries to really mainstream themselves in the right way. And this treaty is opening the possibility for those states who are outside the NPT and who are uh, with nuclear arms to mainstream themselves in the right way. And I have a different person, I have a different concept about mainstreaming than some of the other mainstreaming that we have heard earlier from, from others. The possibility is there for these countries without being lost in the categories, whether it's a uh, nuclear weapon state category or a non-nuclear weapon state category. This is a definition problem, but a very serious problem in the context of NPT. We don't have that problem. We have only one category. So if they join, uh, there is no methodological or other difficulty in, the, in which category they join the CTP. Uh, in addition to that, of course, it's important uh, for them to show and to a certain degree realize that in the long run it's very difficult to foresee uh, two categories of countries with nuclear weapons. One which are under the NPT and uh, do have uh, certain obligations under the NPT, do have certain obligations from the CPPT and other nuclear weapons which do not have obligations be it from the NPT, CTPT or for other for. So again, this is a, a, a choice which will rest in the future as well for those countries, but they should move in the right direction. Again, so from that point of view, it's important that uh, at least uh, one of them, Israel, uh, did make this signature. In the context of the, of the Middle East, uh, the, the issue of the, of the presence of, of Israel as a signatory, I call it uh, 
the right step in the right direction. It's absolutely clear that this is not the, the full road, that there are, there are important additional efforts uh, to, be, to be made. If you uh, consider some of the uh, requirements put forward by, by Israel, which uh, would, in the words of Israel, enable Israel to, to ratify the, the treaty, my feeling is that in the midterm, that those requirements uh, uh, can be easily met. Uh, I don't consider then that uh, those uh, three requirements are insurmountable. I very much observe the, the presence of, of Israel in, a, in, a, in an arrangement which is related to the prohibition of one aspect of nuclear weapon activities as a testing ground for Israel as well, where it can uh, gain uh, the, the, the right uh, experience and hopefully we Israel, we move Israel to the ratification. Under the big tent of the uh, test and treat organization, uh, by now we have around two thirds, more than half, in between half and two thirds of the wider Middle East countries which have ratified the treaty. And uh, in terms of the uh, monitoring facilities, uh, we have again uh, around two thirds of the monitoring facilities from the region as well. The number of monitoring facilities is not necessarily uh, just to express how far the uh, treaty can be mon monitored in the regional context. For me, it's an expression of a dedication of, of, of countries belonging to that region to, to transparency. These two numbers, ratification and uh, openness, transparency, for me bodes well if we again try to conceptualize the test ban treaty as one of the three important pillars of a, a nuclear weapon free zone Middle East. If I just take out of the weapons of uh, mass destruction, the nuclear component, with a lot of simplification, it's like a tripod. It will have to stand on no weapons, no test, no misuse of fissile material. Verification added as well. So one leg is standing there with, with additional elements to be added, like the ratification of Israel, additional ratifications from the region. The countries are working together, not just on the notion of who should be the, 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 who should be the key uh, players for, for, the, for the future the conference on the, on the Middle East, but they are working together on a, not once in five years, not once in one year, not once in, in a month, but they are continuously, practically 24-7, 365 days per year working together. And hopefully the, the experience they gain might lead those who have doubts about the possibility of bringing all the countries from the Middle East under the big trend with, with full ratification we bring them in the right direction. But this is, this is not the end of the universe, not the way around. This cooperation uh, might be bringing us closer to more security for everyone in the region. Uh, I don't know when uh, uh, Jonathan will shoot me down. <laughs> you will have to tell me how much time I have. I have a couple of more bullet points. Uh, very quickly, Jonathan, you will have to tell me when I should wrap up. Uh, on the on the entry into force uh, in, in general, and, and it's relevant for this um, category of countries which are outside the MPP uh, with nuclear weapons. Uh, I would be the last one to uh, drop too many good words about the entry into force formula for the CTPT. Uh, I call it uh, hopefully a double pleasure. Lawyers invented for the first and for the last time an entry into force formula based on inspirations for, uh, from the political masters, of course. But uh, the entry into force formula is creating an interesting context for those um, 
countries which are outside MPT because uh, it's very difficult to do the finger pointing. Until the treaty is enforced with all the remaining eight countries ratified, a signature or a ratification by those countries which have not done so doesn't change necessarily the equation significantly for them. The signature might change because, again, those countries which uh, are right now covered with no obligations, no norms, should, should we have to think about mainstreaming themselves. But even those who signed it, they cannot say that, look, I will not, I will not ratify it until a country uh, which is quite relevant for me from the point of view of behavior, did so. So I would like to emphasize this aspect of the engine to force formula as, a, as an interesting uh, absence of, of um, uh, logical or, or semi-logical uh, finger pointing. No, I cannot do it until another country did it in this country because of the geostrategic or other interest is quite relevant for my national security. Uh, I have to move on to another issue and uh, these are like just flagging certain aspects where again the standards, uh, emerging standards might be interesting on policies and practices. Uh, the, the dual use problem. Uh, the, the whole spectrum of nuclear design and non-proliferation and, and uh, some of the related issues is so much complex because of the dual use element. Um, as a result of, of the wisdom of the negotiators, what we have in front of us is a clear line. A clear line where, uh, where uh, countries position themselves whether they would like to be on the side of no tests or they do not choose to be, right, uh, to be on the side of the no test. There is no uh, notion of inalienable right to the peaceful use of, of, of uh, nuclear weapon tests. And it's absolutely important because the clarity is there. This clarity is to be defined by the countries themselves. No one is putting them in the wrong category. If they choose to be in the wrong category, to be on the wrong side of this line, it's only them who are, who are doing that. Again, the entry into force formula is a reminder that there is no excuse to be on that side. So again, uh, this, is a, this is a standard which is, which is uh, quite specific for the Tensman uh, Treaty, but I uh, wouldn't ignore it for future endeavors and we might try to have a closer look how far we can narrow down or how far we will have to handle the issues of dual use, especially in the context of the fissile material. Uh, governments, uh, I would like to mention here uh, the notion that I am repeating as many times as I can. All these uh, emerging policies and practices and standards uh, can work in an all-inclusive setting, can work in a global setting. Things can work at the level of 180 plus. We are at 183 right by the membership. And things can work even, I would say, at the level of 200. It's not a big difference, probably. An issue as complex both politically and technically, I would add uh, financially and scientifically, as the Tesman Treaty can build a regime which is an all-inclusive regime, and which is based on true all-inclusive global pillars. Um, I, 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 I'm always recalling what I heard when uh, Copenhagen on climate change failed. There was a lot of passion that the, the floor is too big, there are too many players, it's very difficult to do meaningful business. No, you can do meaningful business with one in 83, one in 93, or potentially with 203 countries. I think it's an absolutely important message for you to take away. It's an important message for those countries which are embedded in this forum to take away. 
I was referring to the, to the B5, some of the uh, defining features of, of their being embedded in a, in a wider arrangement and playing their role, playing their role in a constructive, transparent and verifiable, verifiable way. Or regional arrangements like the, like the Middle East countries participation in a much wider context. It's a changing configuration. There are many, many benefits. It can be a peace source. It can be a benefit for those nuclear weapon states who are outside the NPT. It can be for, uh, for Middle East. It can be for Africa. But in this changing configuration, we don't, for each and every aspect, creating a separate forum, we have, we have a scene where all these benefits can be derived in, a, in, in, a, in an efficient and, and meaningful way. On uh, some of the uh, aspects of why all-inclusive works, um, and this is where I would like to come back to, to, to some of the uh, benchmarking of how far politically, scientifically, technically what we are producing is relevant and how far it's cost efficient. Compared to the, to the benchmarking what is unfolding right now, be it the, the uh, region critical deal benchmarking or the monetary benchmarking, probably this benchmarking will happen for each and every forthcoming FREDCOM and uh, the main target will be the 2015 review conference. In our case, the benchmarking is going on uh, real time. And I, I might ask uh, Yuri Kotzeko to, to show two, uh, two um, databases. Uh, one is called PR tool, the second is CR tool. The PR tool is practically probably in between one to two hundred different aspects of our delivery as, a, as an arrangement, including major elements like data from stations, and I think this is uh, one of the few data availability. Uh, uh, at any moment, anyone can check how we are delivering as an arrangement, all-inclusive global arrangement, we want to date this week, how we are delivering on what we should deliver on, data availability, how indeed a system with 280 facilities right now can reach a data availability of around 90% and how hopefully with even 300 and 380 we will be ready to, to do that. It's, um, you can look as a, as a member of our community, as an investor in our community in any of the aspects at any moment. So you don't have to wait one year to assess where we are. You can go to this database, choose any of the stations out of 280 stations, choose any of the aspects out of 200 different aspects of measuring us, choose any of the timelines out of 10, 15, 20, 50 different timelines and make your assessment whether we are on the right track or not. It can be, it can be on the technicalities and it can be of, of seismic uh, hydroacoustic infrasound, waveform technologies, or it can be on the radio climber gas CR tool is one example. Um, Fukushima, can, can we show the Fukushima uh, timeline? Uh, Fukushima was a reminder, it's relevant for verification and it's relevant for non-verification as well to see whether all these stations are up and running, what is the data availability. And of course, the information which is provided at any moment to anyone is an important feature as well. Let me, let me conclude on, on, on this issue, my, my points. All inclusive and global means that, uh, yes, there is a, an emerging standard, an emerging policy and practice related to nuclear weapons, one of the most important aspects of nuclear weapons, where uh, at any moment, any country can know exactly what's going on in this obligation. Why? Because we have an all-inclusive data gathering from uh, around 90 countries and uh, around 280 facilities right now. We have an all-inclusive understanding how this data is being processed. It can be processed by all the 183 countries independently of us or together with us if they wish. 
And we have a data data product distribution which enables countries to get the data within split minutes and to get the data products within limited hours available, knowing everything what they should know at any moment globally. This is um, again a 24 7 global all inclusive verification arrangement. And my message is all inclusive and global works. Thank you.